Welcome back. Um, I hope you've all done a good job on your essays. We haven't started marking them yet. Um, most of the teachers are very busy doing other things with the other students at present, but they will all be finished by the end of the month, don't worry. And then it's up to you guys to start working on them and improving them for the second draft. So, you guys get something, something special today. Last year's Startup Programme students did not get this lecture. Um, last year's Startup Programme students had two lectures by me, the first one on writing you've already had, and the next one on presentations, which I'll give you. Someone else did the middle one, but they didn't want to do it this year, so you get me again. That's the bad news. Um, the good news is, hopefully I can demonstrate some tech things that you guys will learn when you come here in April. So I'm giving you a kind of heads up to get started with some of the things that you will be learning when you come here. Um, technology is very, very important in education these days. So important. If you imagine when you go to the library, does anyone pull open a drawer and look through cards looking for a book? Nor anymore. The card catalogues have all been transferred into an online database. You want to find a journal article? You don't go browsing through the shelves, you probably browse through a search engine online. So being able to find information and send it, store it, receive it, share it in a technological digital way is a very important skill for students to have in the modern age. So this is stuff that until last year, these classes covering this stuff were only elective classes for students who choose to take them. As of the first year students now, they've become compulsory classes because we've finally realised that everyone should learn these skills to be able to function as a student, as a researcher, as an academic. So all the things that I'm going to try and cover and demonstrate today are things that you will have to learn when you come. So the air where you start to think about these things, the air where you create the accounts and play around with them and practice with them, the more proficient you're going to become at using those things. So, anyway, let's get to business. And I have to be careful here. We've got some plastic on the floor. I think there's a musical coming up. So if I slip on this, it's not part of the act. I really have slipped. So I'm trying to be very careful when I'm walking around. Okay, so digital literacy in the classroom. Everyone knows we need literacy in the classroom. You need to be able to read and write. And that was true of education all the way through until now. You had to be able to read and write. But the digital aspect has put an added demand on what students need to be able to do in the classroom. You have to be able to function digitally. You've all hopefully written an essay and submitted it. Did you write it in pen and paper? Did you have a feather that you dipped in ink and you roll it on a scroll? No, you submitted it electronically. We don't allow students to submit handwritten papers. Maybe your handwriting is really bad, I don't know. But everything has to be submitted online. Maybe it's email. Or, at the very least, you're doing it on Microsoft Word and printing it out and giving it to the teacher. But it's still written on a word processor. So there's a certain level of digital skills that you have to master to be able to function in a university in the 21st century. And those kind of skills are the things that you will be learning in your first year and that I'll be giving you a kind of taster today. Now, for better or for worse, you've chosen to come to ICU. And ICU is a little bit different from most other universities. We have three semesters of 10 weeks, 10 weeks, 10 weeks. Other universities have got two 15-week ones. We make you change your teacher at the end of every 10 weeks. Some other universities, you keep the same teacher for the whole year. The biggest difference between ICU and most other universities in Japan is on how many writing assignments you'll get, how many presentation assignments you'll get. You will be worked really hard in your first year. And a common complaint amongst all the students is, I'm too busy, I have no time to do all these assignments, there are too many assignments and not enough time. The so-called curriculum squeeze. We've squeezed so many things into one week of classes and you're busy, 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 busy. 
Well, how do you deal with this kind of problem? How do you deal with having to research all these essays and presentations and write them, prepare them? Well, the solution is technology. Instead of squeezing it by hand, we use a machine. Instead of doing all the research by hand, we use machines. Computers, the internet, and so on. So today I'm going to give you a small demonstration of some of the software things that we use and the reasons why we use them. Because if there's an easy way of doing things, a quick way of doing things, it's in your interest to take the easy, quick way. It gives you more time to do the other assignments. So let's have a look at some of the things that you'll probably learn to use. I don't know how many of these icons you'll recognize. Maybe some of you will recognize some of them. Some of you will recognize others. I don't expect everybody here to know all of these now. I do expect that you'll know all of them by the end of your first year. Um, what have we got here? Uh, we've got Firefox. Um, there's a whole range of good browsers. Internet Explorer is not one of them. Don't use Internet Explorer. Almost all the extensions, plugins, and useful things that we can add to Safari, to Chrome, to Firefox usually don't work well on Internet Explorer. So Chrome is a great browser, Firefox is a great browser, Safari is good as well. Any one of those three browsers, you'll be able to use all the things that we'll be teaching you. Don't expect them to work on Internet Explorer. Um, this is Evernote. Really, really cool note-taking device. Has anyone used it before? One or two. Very, very, very good. Um, Google, obviously, is a search engine. Everybody knows what it is and how to use it, but not everybody uses it well. I'll give you a case in point. Um, I'm teaching one of the higher-level classes, the Stream 2 classes at present. That's your contemporaries one year above you. And last week, uh, no, 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 it was this week actually, on Monday, we were in the computer room and I gave them a Google search challenge. It was a video that was on the Google website and it was only a 40 second video and the video asked them to find three things. The name of an invention, the patent number of the invention and a photo of the invention and they gave them some clues and 27 minutes later all 22 students had found none of the three things because it wasn't as easy as it seemed. So being able to find the information that you're looking for is a very, very important skill. And one of the things that we will be covering is how to use Google and other search engines properly. Because if you can't find the information you need, you can't write anything about it if you can't find the info. So being able to use search engines properly is very important. Um, Blogger, all of you will be creating a blog and writing your blog every week. Um, these are RSS feeds for a thing called Google Reader, enabling you to read many websites at the same time. This should become your best friend. This is for Zotero. Does anybody know Zotero? Lifesaver of your academic writing. And when I showed this to all my students in first year, every one of them said, why did my school teacher not show me this? Because it is so useful for academic writing. And I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of some of the things it can do in a little while. So these are some of the tools that you'll learn. Now, why should you learn to use this technology? Well, one of the things about technology is it's what we call an academic enabler. An enabler is something that enables you to do something. So an academic enabler is something that enables you to do academic study in a better, more efficient way. So, how does this work? Well, as I mentioned briefly before, technology enables more efficient searching for information. If you can search for information quickly and accurately and find the information you need, that's the start to being a good researcher, a good academic, to find the information you need. But when you've got that information, well, you know, what do you do with it once you've found it? Well, you need to catch it. It's on the internet. It's on a website. Might not be there the next time you look. You might forget how you found that website. You need to have an efficient method of capturing, copying that data. 
And again, we'll show you a range of techniques for how you can do that. So, we found something and we've downloaded it from the internet. What do we do next? Well, you need to be able to store it. It has to be stored somewhere. And it has to be stored in a way that's A, easy for you to find it again, and B, easy for you to open it, read it, and so on. That doesn't mean putting it on a USB stick and throwing the USB stick in the cupboard, because then later you can't find the USB stick. There has to be a more efficient storage method. And again, we'll show you a range of techniques for doing that. Most importantly, you have to be able to share your information. And this is probably going to be the newest thing for most of you. My guess is in your school work, you're used to working alone. For studying for the entrance test, you're used to working alone. Studying for exams, you're used to working alone. Here at ICU, in your first year, you'll be given some group projects to do where you will be working with other people and you're expected to work as a team, not alone. Even your teachers, we don't always work alone. A few years ago, I was presenting a paper at a conference. Of course, I had to research the paper and I had to write up the paper. And when the paper was finished, or first draft was finished, the very first thing I did was I gave it to one of my colleagues to read. And then he gave it back with some suggestions and changes and some mistakes and I fixed it. And then I gave it to another colleague and I got his help to read through. And sometimes they give theirs to me. That's what we do. We kind of help each other. We peer review. We check each other's work. That involves a level of sharing. Um, maybe there's someone I really trust in my academic area. Maybe they're in another country. How do I get the document to them? You could say email. Okay. But what if the document is too big for an email? What if it's got video and audio and photos in it that's too big to email? How do we share it with people? Again, there's a range of different ways of doing this. And we'll show you a range of these digital sharing techniques in the class. But lots of people still don't really get this idea of sharing. It's counterintuitive that this is my answer, don't look at it. This is a kind of school approach. So those kind of people always want to know why share. Well, I've mentioned peer review and collaboration, but if you've got people who have different perceptions from you, they'll see some things that you don't. Everyone has a different viewpoint, everyone has a different perspective, and if you ask people with different perspectives, you can get answers that you might not be able to find out from your own perspective. I'll give you an example. I'll come off of this slippy stuff. Okay, um, everybody on this side of the room, your viewpoint, I'll give you back in a second, your viewpoint is different from their viewpoint. If I hold this up here and I ask you guys how many fingers I'm holding up, it's easy for you to answer. Everybody on this side of the room, how many fingers am I holding up? Can you see? They can see easy. Why can't you see? Why can't you see? Because your perception, your viewpoint, your angle of looking is different from theirs. And you can always, thanks, you can always find people whose way of looking at things or whose previous experience or previous knowledge that changes the way they look at things is very different from yours. And they're very good people to get advice from because they can see things that you've missed. And you can see things that they've missed. And by this kind of sharing, you get much closer to the reality, the so-called truth of what you're trying to find. And you can only do that if you share. So in fact, at the end of your first year, you guys will all be given a project. And the projects vary a little bit depending on who your teacher is. At the very least, say there's one, two, three, four people in a team, in a project group. At the very least, each person will be writing a paper that's on a similar topic. And at the very least, all four people will be making a presentation slideshow and you'll be standing giving a presentation. That's at the very least. The very most, if you're in my class, you'll be making a website, you'll be making a video, you'll be uploading the video onto the website, you'll be uploading your essays onto the website, and you'll be doing a whole load more technology stuff, depending on which class you choose for that.
So some teachers use technology lots, some of them use a little, but they're all using it to one extent or the other. And you have to learn how to use these things together as a team. So the teamwork aspect, getting the perceptions from other people in your team is very, very, very important. Very important. So if we've got this teamwork going on, technology enables that teamwork to work very easily. In the past, you could only have teamwork if you were all in the same room at the same time. How many people use Skype? Google Plus Hangouts? There's a whole range of ways where you could have an online video conference meeting. Again, we'll show you how to use some of these things. Even if you don't have a video camera on your computer, and every Apple computer has a camera on it, not every Windows one does, um, so if you're one of those poor Windows people who has a computer that has no camera, you could still do a chat, a text-based chat, so that you could have a meeting with people, even if you're not in the same place, in the same space at the same time. So there's a range of technology things that enables teamwork to work. And if your team works properly, come on, come on, come on, we can make stuff. So at the very least, you'll be making a presentation slideshow like PowerPoint or something like that. At the very most, you'll be making a website, a video and uploading your papers and all that kind of stuff, but you will be making something that you have as evidence of what you've done. It could be a Word document for the paper and a PowerPoint slideshow. It could be the website. It could be a video of the slideshow with your voice narrating it. There's a range of things that different teachers do with me kind of being at the top end of the scale. And some of you will get a choice of which class you take for some of these projects. So if you're not really interested in this stuff, you would choose one of the Sophomore classes that doesn't do this. And if you're really interested in it, you would sign up for the ones that do. But there is a base level of this stuff that you will all have to learn to use. And what else about technology? Well, technology improves your skills as well. So, so far we've looked at nature photos. Let's see what happens if we add technology. How many rabbits would be caught by the fox if he had a sniper rifle? Technology could improve the fox's skills. Um, what about creativity? Can technology improve creativity? Cats don't normally paint. Give the cat the paint. You might see that stuff. And who said you can't teach old dogs new tricks? Think of what's possible with technology. Technology can improve students' abilities. Now, who says so? Who said technology can improve students' abilities? Well, me. <laughs> Do you disagree? Do you believe me? Well, fortunately, you don't have to take my word for it. I'm not the only person who says this. There are some other people who say this too. Um, University of Cambridge, I'm sure you've probably heard of them, one of the more famous higher quality universities in the UK. They've got CARIT, which is their Centre for Applied Research and Educational Technology. So this is technology being used in academic settings. And they've done a load of work, a load of surveys. And they found out a few things. That if you bring technology into the classroom, it influences student academic performance. It usually kind of increases the performance. It develops higher order thinking and problem solving. Now... There's a difference between high order thinking and low order thinking. Low order thinking is related to memorization. And you've got to remember how to do stuff. Higher order thinking is more like kind of creativity. Now, there, just to use Zotero as an example, every essay needs to have a, a reference list, a works cited list, a bibliography at the end of the essay. And how you write things in that bibliography, reference list, works cited list, there are very strict rules. Do it this way, don't do it that way. And in the past, you had to remember all these rules. Remembering rules is lower order thinking. And you only have a set amount of brain power. And if you have to use a bit of it to remember all those things, it means there's less left over for the creative higher order problem solving. 
So, if you don't have to remember all those rules, if you can use a software program, and I recommend Zotero, and I'll show you later, if you can use a software program to do that for you, then you don't need to spend much effort remembering the rules. You've got more effort and more brain power free to be more creative in problem solving and so on. So we can kind of subcontract the boring memory tasks to software and free up our brains for the higher order can improve motivation, attitude, and interest in learning. Technology for a lot of people is new, and many people use it socially, you know, Twitter, Facebook, emails, that kind of stuff. So people don't always associate that with work, with academic study. So if you give them academic study that uses, you know, Twitter feeds and so on and so on, it doesn't seem so bad, it seems more interesting because it's something they use outside the class as well, and they get more motivated. Technology can also help low performers. There's grammar checkers and spell checkers that can help improve the quality of the work that lower level students submit. And it helps prepare you for work. The whole point to come to university is to get a good education, to show an employer that you're going to be a good worker, to get a good job. And when you work, companies use technology, so they're kind of looking for people to work for them who they don't have to teach much of the technology to because you already know it. So these are some of the benefits that the University of Cambridge found. Now, BETA is another group, British Educational Communications Technology Agency, and they've done some studies, and they've also found out that the benefits of in using technology in the class improved motivation and enjoyment, higher level of strategic learning, and improved teacher and student confidence, because you realise, hey, this computer stuff is actually quite easy. And it gives people a little confidence boost. Now, even for language, quite a well-known book here, using IT in the language classroom, they've found out that it's had a significant effect on how much people's language has improved by using technology. There's online translators and grammar checkers and so on. So all different aspects of education, technology has been found to be very useful, very beneficial for students. So, Moving on a little bit. This guy here, educational technology professor, and he's found that from all his studies, technology has been useful to learn from and with. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, connect, collaborate, and create. There have been a few classes where there was a university up in Hokkaido, Mirai Dagaku, a future university, and one of the teachers that was presenting at a seminar there told me about something he did that using the internet, using Skype, using Google Chat, using Google Plus Hangouts, he got his class of English language students in Hokkaido to do a joint online project with another class of students from Colombia in South America who were also learning English. They spoke Spanish, people in Hokkaido spoke Japanese, the only common language they had was English, and they were able to hook the two classes up together to do this online project. So my plan was to do that this year because I had a colleague who was teaching in Bangkok in Thailand, but unfortunately before I could get that set up, he moved to another job in Australia. So my plan kind of collapsed. So I need to find someone else for next year. But for me, that's a very good example of the connect, collaborate, create. You can be teamed up with anybody anywhere using the technology. Um, I don't know who I'm going to find, but I go to a lot of conferences worldwide and there's a good chance that I will actually find someone who has a class, his students' learners are the same level as mine, and hook them up. There's websites where teachers advertise this kind of stuff, so it should be possible. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this, ACOT. This is the Apple Classrooms of Tomorrow program. It's Apple Computer Company. They worked with some high schools in California and they did this research project that they gave the schools loads of computers, technology, software training to see what would happen in terms of the students and, you know, were there any good points, bad points and what could be done to improve. So they came up with what they figured were the six principles for a 21st century high school. And you guys are still in high school now, so you'll be able to judge how well your high school conforms to this pattern. So, the first thing they said is high schools, you know, they're kind of preparing students for the future. You're going to have to work. 
They should be teaching and understanding 21st century skills. So this means we don't need to teach people how to use a typewriter. Ching, 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 plump, ching, 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 plump, because no one uses them anymore. But we do need to teach you how to type, just you're doing the typing on a word processor or on an iPad or some computer or something like that, rather than a typewriter. So they have to make sure that what they're teaching you is relevant to the 21st century. That was the first thing. And the curriculum, the things that you're studying, are relevant to the modern world. And it's not just theory, but you're actually studying the application of how to do something. Your assessments should be informative. When you submit a paper, or an essay, or a presentation, or any piece of work to the teacher, if the teacher just says B and gives it back to you, or C and gives it back, or A and gives it back, is that really informative? It's not. You don't know why you got an A or a B or a C. So the feedback on the paper needs to be informative. The school needs to encourage creativity and innovation. And this is something I try to do in my classes. You're free to create your own website, the style, the design, how you organize it. This is all your choice, not mine. So there's a lot of creativity emphasized here. Um, you need to have a social and emotional connection with students. You need to be able to relate to them to understand the problems that they have. And, you know, maybe they do things together socially as well. In the ELA, there's quite a few classes take their teachers out at the end of the semester. Maybe they go to, like, some kind of family restaurant or izakaya or something together. It varies from class to class, teacher to teacher. But we try to do have that kind of stuff in the ELA. And the last one, ubiquitous access to technology. This means technology is all around. Well, I don't know about ICU High, but ICU is a Wi-Fi campus. So you'll be able to access the internet anywhere you are. Um, we've got loads of computer rooms, Mac rooms, window rooms, multimedia rooms, and so on. So ICU is definitely trying to fit this kind of model. I, I don't know about your own schools, how well or not so well they connect to this. Okay. But the bottom line, though, is you have to think. And technology helps you do the thinking. It can help you find the information that you need to think about. It can help you order that information. It can help you share that information. But it won't do the thinking for you. you still got to think for yourself. Now, thinking is a very important skill. And one of the things that we'll be emphasizing all the way through your first year, and you will be sick of hearing this by the end of the first year, is critical thinking, critical thinking, critical thinking, critical thinking. We emphasize that so much. And it is something that you have to do. That's one thing that technology won't do for you. You have to be critical thinkers. You know, Plato, Aristotle, Homer. Think like this. Don't think like this, Homer. Don't! It's not going to get you very much of the answers. Wrong kind of thinking. So, thinking then. Let's think about education. And again, what people think about education very much depends on the culture that you come from and the school that you come from. And traditionally, Japan thought of education as memorization, rote memory. You had to remember all these useless facts for tests. Didn't get to do anything with the facts, you just had to remember them. When was the American Civil War? Ah, it was 1860 to 1865. Don't know why it happened, but not important. Just remember the numbers. That rote memory is not education. You want to remember stuff? That's what memory sticks are for. Your computer's got a better memory than you. You only need to remember a little bit of things. Your advantage over the computer is what you can do with the information, not the memory of it. You've got all loads of devices for memory. So, education is not about memorization. It's about something else. Education is about exploration. It's about going to new places with your mind, finding new things, thinking new thoughts, working out new solutions to problems. And like all exploration, you need tools. You want to go exploring, you need good boots. You want to go exploring, you need a waterproof jacket. You need a compass, you need a map. The technology and your teachers, we can kind of help you choose the direction, give you guides on where to go, but you have to do the walking. We won't do the walking for you. We'll show you how to find the information. We'll show you how to store it, how to organize it, how to share it, how to use it, but you have to do the work. So like we are teachers and technology, we're like your compass. 
We can point you in the right direction and show you how to get there, but you have to do the walking with the equipment and the instructions that we give you. That's essentially what technology and education is really about. And this is what our new classes are hopefully doing for you guys. So, we've got an educational evolution going on here. If we think of old, old, old education, tablets. Tablets was hammer and chisel. Tablets now are a little bit different. And a couple of years ago, um, I wanted to do a project with iPads, so I actually contacted Apple and I said, please Apple, can I borrow 22 iPad 2s? And they said, yeah. And they gave me 22 iPads for a month, I gave them out to my students for a month, take them home, use them on the train, wherever, and for a whole month my class had these 22 iPads, one per student, to use technology 24-7 all the time. And they used them for making their projects and they used the video camera to record some things to put on their website. And the project worked fairly well. That's what I mean about using technology and education together. Now, it's probably not likely that Apple are going to lend me them again because I've already completed that project, but you never know. It might be that ICU decides to buy a whole load of iPads. We don't know, but there's certainly technology is going to play a bigger and a bigger role in your education in the years to come. So you've got to be make sure you're using this kind of tablet and not that kind of tablet. Okay. So you want to get free from any limitations and move to liberation. If you've got Wi-Fi and you've got like remote type stuff, you could be sitting out. How many people know what Bakayama is? Not very many of you. The Hongkan building, which is the main classroom building, has two grassy hills outside. One of them is called Bakayama and the other one's called Ahoyama. The Wi-Fi even extends to those hills. So sometimes in the summer I take my students outside, some other teachers do as well, and we have classes outside sitting in the sunshine and you can still access your laptop, your iPad and so on and so on. The Wi-Fi even works there. So liberation. No limitations, yeah? So, putting all this stuff together, there's a very new approach to teaching and technology. It's called TPAC. Now, under the old education system, if I wanted to teach you history, I just needed to know history. If I wanted to teach you politics, I only needed to know politics. If I wanted to teach you anthropology, I only needed to know anthropology. I know it, I can teach it to you. And many of the teachers were terrible. They were so boring. Standing here, and today we will read about this history. This happened, then this happened. Everyone's sleeping. Because the teachers knew everything about the subject, they didn't know how to teach. So a more modern version of this was you needed to know your subject, the content, plus you needed to know pedagogy. And pedagogy is the way of teaching. There's a good way of teaching, there's a bad way of teaching. And teachers needed to know the stuff and how to teach the stuff. So there was a blend between content and pedagogy. And that was better. Now in the modern world, three things have came together. We've got the P and the A for pedagogy. We've got the C for content, the K is for knowledge. It's also technology. So as technology is changing, pedagogy is changing. Because now we can do things with technology that we couldn't do 10 years ago, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if I had a documentary movie I wanted my students to watch. I would have to have a TV in the room, I would need to have a VCR player in the room, I would need to have the cassette in the room, I need to make sure the TV was loud enough that everybody in the room could hear, it was big enough that everybody could see or they'd have to sit down the front. And it was a little bit of a pain to have everybody watching the documentary. Plus, if the documentary is one hour, this is one hour in class when we can't do anything else because everybody's watching the documentary. Um, you couldn't copy it because there were all these like copyright protections in the cassette if you copy it the picture's not good and so on and so on well modern technology any DVD can be copied for educational purposes only I hasten to add not pirating um, when it's copied it can then be stored online and you can share it with a folder with the other students and you could assign them to watch it 
for homework. So they could watch it on their home TV, their home computer at their own time, so that when they come to the next class, everybody's already seen it, and we can start the discussion right away. So technology has changed the pedagogy. It's called the flipped classroom. Under the old system, we would have to do everything in the class, and I would tell you to go away and think about it for homework. Well, moving this around, I can get you to do the watching at home and we can do the discussing and the making and the creating in the classroom. So technology is changing the pedagogy. The content knowledge has stayed the same. I still need to know history or anthropology or politics or whatever it is. But if I'm knowledgeable about the technology and the pedagogy, one can change the other and both of them keep changing and improving the way that teachers can teach the content. And if you look at what teachers are doing in a class today, it's very, very different from what they were doing 10 years ago, which is really different from what they were doing 30 years ago. So all these things are changing. But this is what I call teach. Technology, education, academia, creativity, all together here. Bringing all those things together, that's my personal view of what the future of education should be about. Technology blending with all of these different things all coming together. So I said I'd give you a demonstration of some of these things, so I'm going to do that in just a second. Um, almost everything which I've went through today, um, there's a big list of references here. Um, what I can do is make sure that I give a copy of my slideshow to the office and we can put the slideshow up on the Net Commons and you'll be able to see all the sources where I got all the information from. So you don't need to worry about taking notes. This slide will be up on the Net Commons site pretty soon. And if you want to find out where I got all this information, you know, all of this stuff um, is going to be here. So let me, I'm going to be sitting here for a while. Um, can I have a chair? Do we have a chair in here? I'm going to sit down now and hopefully demonstrate some of these things thanks, that I said I would demonstrate. So let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, let's get out of here first. Where is my system preferences? Let's mirror display. Okay, now my screen is the same as yours. Okay. Um, here I am on Firefox, a browser, and I mentioned to you guys about Zotero. Um, I've installed Zotero on my Firefox, so you can see I've got my little Zotero icon here. Zotero also works on a desktop version, which will work with Google Chrome and Safari. So let's take a quick survey. Um, how many people use Google Chrome? Uh, Safari? Firefox? Great, good students. Internet Explorer? Terrible students. <laughs> okay, don't use Internet Explorer. Zotero doesn't work with Internet Explorer, right? Um, what does it do? Okay, I'll open this up. I can click on my little Zotero. And there's a folder here. I'll create a new folder. And let's call it, uh, what we'll call it, um, oops, I can't even see, I've got this messy cover, Startup. We'll call it the Startup folder, yeah? So I've created a folder called Startup. Here it's here. And so far, I've got nothing in my Startup folder. No, not yet. So, I'm writing an essay. And I need books to write my essay. Well, let's say I read the, all these books. Well, I need to use them. So, I'll go to Amazon. Let's just close this down for a moment. I'll select books. And let's say my essay was on history. Let's throw this out there. So, if I put in history and I search, Amazon is bringing me up 5,188,704 history books, right? More than I could ever read. And it puts them 12 on each page, showing 1 to 12. And here they are. Short history of the world, greatest stories, history of the US, 10 great events, blah, 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 blah. We can see all 12 here. Now, because I have Zotero installed, there's a little yellow folder here. And I can click this folder, and I can see all 12 of these books. And I can select the ones that I want. 
let's choose these five, I can click OK. And the data from these five books is now added to my Zotero. So for example, here's a short history of the world. It's a book. Here's the title, Short History of the World. It's by H.G. Wells. Here's the publisher. Here's the date. Here's the number of pages. Here's the ISBN number. Here's where I found it on Amazon. Here's the date I added it to my Zotero. And I could put some notes. I can click note, add, and let's put in C, page 45 to 67, for example. So I've made a little note. Then I can go to Frontier in American History. Again, here's a book, it's the title, Frontier, here's the author, Frederick Turner, here's the publisher, here's number of pages, etc. I can put a note in, add, see, page 67 to 89, for example, and on and on and on. And I can do all these notes for any of these. Now, what else I can do? I could go to Google Books. Um, how many people have a Gmail account? Great students. Um, this is one of the first things you'll be told to do when you come to ICU, if you don't already have one, is make a Gmail account. There are so many things that you can do with Gmail. Um, on the 9th and the 10th of February at ASIJ, anyone here from ASIJ? No. ASIJ, American School in Japan, on the 9th and the 10th of February, Google are having their Tokyo Google Education Summit. And lots of different people are going to be there presenting different things. I'm going to be giving a presentation there for Google as well. If you want to go to this Google Weekend Education Summit, it costs $250 for a ticket. You can learn most of this stuff in the ELA in first year for free. But it is very, very useful. So make sure you've got a Gmail account. So one of the things that comes with your Gmail account is something called Google Books. So again, if I put in history and I search for the books on you know, Google Books, I can look through here. Here's a book, History of Oral History. And I can probably read, it says here, one of 97. It's going to let me read 97 pages of this book online for free. And if I like this book, there's a little book icon that Zotero puts here. I can click, and this book is also added to my Zotero. And I can read through here, and I can, oh, page six, that's great. So I can open my Zotero, history of oral history, put in a note, Add, C, page 6. And I've added my note. Now, also on Google Books, if I jump back to my whole list, again, I've got the yellow folder, and I can add more than one at the same time. And again, they'll be added. So any books I can find on Amazon, any books I can find on Google Books, I can add them here into my Zotero Easy. And it's not just books. What about news stories? I'm on the BBC. Um, here's a story, Kerry Eyes, Mideast Talks Revival, US Politics, Middle East, blah, 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 blah. This is a newspaper story, and when it finishes loading, come on, come on, come on, we can see Zotero puts a little newspaper here. I click on the newspaper, and the story's added. Here it is, newspaper, Kerry Eyes, Mideast Talks Revival. It's a newspaper article. Title, Kerry Eyes Midi Survival. There's no author because the BBC don't tell you who wrote it. But we've got an abstract. We know it's from the BBC. We've got the date. We've got the section of the BBC. We've got the URL. All the information we need is there. And again, I could put in a note and I could put uh, good, good on ME Paul. Good on Middle Eastern politics, for example. I've added my little note. Um, Maybe your source is a documentary. Maybe you've seen a documentary movie. IMDB. We go to the Internet Movie Database. Everybody know the IMDB? Anybody? It's an online page that lists movies. So, for example, um, Michael Moore Sickle. Here's the documentary movie. Um, it's about 
medical care, health care, economics and so on in the US. That's related to bioethics, which you guys will study in winter. So here I am, I'm on the Michael Moore sickle page on IMDb, and Zotero puts a little movie icon. I can click it, and the movie is added here. So here we go, sickle, I go to the info, uh, it's a film, the title is Sicko, directors, Michael Moore, screenwriter, scriptwriter, so on and so on. All the information about it is here. I could add a note. Now, because it's a movie, there's no pages. I could see C minute 45 to 50, for example, to remind me where is the information that I need. Um, journal articles. I could go to Google Scholar. Go into Google Scholar, put in history as a keyword. Oops, history. Whoops, did I mean history? Yes, I did. And again, it brings me up a whole list of things, articles and so on. Again, I can click my little yellow folder. Uh, here's an article, here's a PDF, and here's a citation. I can add them. So I have got all these different sources coming up here. Now, uh, go to Google Docs. Let's open a new one. Google Docs. Let me log in. And I'm going to create a new document. Has anyone used Google Docs before? Not many of you. Okay, big difference between Google Docs and Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is a good word processor. But the files that you store with Microsoft Word, they're stored on your computer. And then you come into ICU and, oh, sorry, I forgot to bring my USB stick with my document. Oops. Well, if you use Google Docs, the document is not stored on your computer. It's stored on the internet on Google Documents as part of your Gmail account, which means any computer anywhere in the world, you can always access your document. So this is what I've just done, um, hopefully, has opened up a Google Doc. So I'm on my untitled document, yeah? Uh, let's just close some of these guys down. Now we can see here, let's just move this up a little bit. You can see here, um, these are all the sources I've added. Here's my newspaper, here's my books, here's my film, here's some more books, here's a document. I've added all of these to my Zotero. Now what do I do? I start writing my essay. Here's my essay. And I finish my essay. Very fast. And what comes at the essay? Well, we have something called references, or it's sometimes called works cited, depending on whether you're using APA or MLA or Chicago, and sometimes it's called a bibliography. De depending on which system of referencing you're using will depend on whether you call it references, works cited, or bibliography. Now, when we go into the settings, of our Zotero, we go to preferences, we go to export, and we can see, I can choose, do I want to use American Medical Association, Anthropological, APA, Chicago, Harvard, MLA, Vancouver, there's a whole range of different styles I can choose to use. Um, the ELA, in your first year, usually uses MLA. When you get to your second year, your ICU teachers will tell you which one to use depending on which subject you're studying. If you're studying history, politics, economics, international relations, that kind of stuff, you're more likely to be using Chicago. If you're studying anthropology, sociology, linguistics, psychology, you're more likely to use APA. If you're studying lang uh, languages or literature, you're more likely to use MLA. You would choose which one depending on what subject 
you're writing about and your teacher would tell you which one. Um, the two that I use for my own writing most often for the places I send my writing is either APA or Chicago. So we'll choose APA just for the moment. So here's APA. Here's my bibliography. I'm going to highlight all of the things that I want to use. And I just need to drag them in. Bada bing. And there's my works cited list. All perfectly formatted according to APA. Family name, comma, initial, dot, year, title. Publisher. Now, probably you haven't encountered this yet. For the movies, this is perfect. For the journal articles, this is perfect. For the books, there's one small mistake. Let's move this up a bit. Here's the book. Let's move this a bit bigger. And we can see it's a book. Here's the title. Here's the author. Here's the publisher. Here's the date. Here's the number of pages. The place is missing. Now, for all your referencing, you always need to put in the place of publication. It's APA asks for it, MLA asks for it, Chicago asks for it. You need to put it in. Now, we got those books from Google Books and we got them from Amazon. Amazon and Google Books don't tell you the place of publication. So Zotero can't add it. You need to add it by yourself. So here, create space, independent publishing platform, blah, 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 blah. I would do a Google search for them, find out where they are, and, you know, maybe they're in New York. Then I would just manually add New York. Oh, I need to put New York in here. Sorry. Uh, where did I go? Uh, where did I put that in? Ah, here we go. Manually add New York, and I've added it. Then, when I drag this in here, it would also have New York in there. Now, what I've done is I've put this in APA style. And I find out, oh no, my professor wanted MLA. Okay, easy. Just delete them all. Open Zotero. Go to my preferences. It's probably under here somewhere. Yep. And then I can just select MLA. Go back here. Select them all. Drag them in. And it's now an MLA. And MLA style is a little bit different from APA in that MLA doesn't tell you the website address. It just says web. Slightly different. Same thing again. I could delete them all out. Go back to my Zotero. Uh, maybe I realize I'm writing for history and politics, for example. So I would go in here, this time I would change it to Chicago, full note, go back here, drag them in, come on, come on, come on. And you can see here, Chicago is a little bit different because Chicago gives you the full name. APA and MLA was just Abbott, comma, J. Chicago gives you the full name and Chicago... Uh, where are we? Gives you the URL. So each of the three main styles, APA, MLA, Chicago, they all give you slightly different information organized in a different way. And using Zotero, it's very, very easy to chop and change and move between them. And Zotero also works with Microsoft Word. It works with OpenOffice. It works with NeoOffice. It works with Google Documents. It will work with almost all the word processors. Now, look at this list. Imagine if you had to remember all the rules. Do I need the full name or just an initial? Does the full name come first or the family name come first? Is the title in italics or not italics or inverted commas? What about the publisher? Inverted commas, not inverted commas, italics, underlined. Every one of those different systems has a different set of rules. And the guidebook for Chicago is about 600 pages. The guidebook for APA is about three, four hundred pages. The guidebook for MLA is about two or three hundred pages. 
Do you want to have to remember all those rules? Or do you want to just let Zotero take care of it and free up your brain for creative thinking? This is what I mean about the technology being able to take care of the low order thinking and you freeing up your brain power for the high order thinking. And you saw me create that bibliography. Click, click, bang, done. How long would it take you if you had to write that in by hand and double check everything? It would take you a much longer time. So obviously, using programs like Zotero, and there's another one which is good called Mendeley, does the same kind of thing. ICU Library has both of them. This is very, very good for you. Now, how do you get this onto your computer? And what do you do with it? Well, I'll show you that in a moment. I just want to show you one other thing that we can do with Microsoft Word. This was creating the bibliography, the work cited. But inside your papers, you also have to put in-text citations. Come on, come on, come on. Microsoft Word is stuck. Come on. New blank document, I hope. Come on, come on, come on. See what happens? Ah, here we go, right. Okay, so I'm typing my essay. Da -la 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 -la. Come on. Microsoft Word. Use something by Microsoft and it sticks. The prosecution rests. Okay, so I got something typed up here. And I've decided that I need a reference for this. Well, I've already installed Zotero on my Microsoft Word too. I can click this little icon, I can select Zotero, and I can set my document preferences. Come on, come on, open up. Come on. Yes, so APA, okay. So now I want to put something in here. So I select Zotero, add a citation, and I choose the book that I want, um, 10 Great Events in History, and from my notes I know I needed page 45, and I go, okay, and it adds in, Johanna 2011, page 45. And I can type some more stuff. I can go back again, Zotero, add a citation, I can choose a different book, and I can put in page, I don't know, 34, for example. Now, my next thing, maybe this comes from two books. Here, Zotero, add a citation, and I can choose multiple sources. So the first one comes from Food, move it across, uh, page 12. Maybe the second one, oral history, move it across. Uh, maybe this is page 34. And the last one, world is flat, move it across and put this one in 56. Now this world is flat, maybe that's the most important one. Okay, I'll move that to first. Okay. And now, come on, come on, I've got all three. Friedman, 2006, 56. Charlton et al., 2007, page 34. Friedman, da 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 da. Now, when I get down to my work cited on Microsoft Word, I can choose Zotero, add a bibliography, and Zotero automatically finds all of these. Bang. And it only finds the ones I've used and puts them in to alphabetical order, putting in all the data that I need. Really quick for me, means I can be finished this really quick and go back to having my beer, or playing with my children, or doing something much more fun. So, how do you add Zotero to your Microsoft Word? How do you add Zotero to your Firefox? Um, best thing is, let's see, technology hyphen in hyphen 
teaching. There's a website called Technology and Teaching, and it's got a photo of a very, very handsome man on it. Come on, stuck. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, who's that handsome man? And on this website, if you click the videos section, you'll see I made two videos. Come on, come on, come on. About how to add Microsoft Word's Zotero and how to put Zotero onto Firefox. And if you click these two videos, I think they're also on ICU's library page as well. I gave them to the library. Okay, forget about that. Come on, come on. Now, there's no sound cable. I didn't connect this in, but on your home computer, if you go to the website www.technology-n-teaching.com, technology and teaching, TNT, it's dynamite. Um, you can see the videos are here. I can click play. And hopefully it will play. Depends on the internet speed in this room, I guess. Yeah, it's very slow. Um, I'm guessing this is related to the Wi-Fi in this room, that it's not loading very fast. Um, when you're over in the main campus or the main buildings, it will load... All the instru you probably can't hear it because the sound is just here, but on your home computer, you can have this open in the window and you can follow through step by step by step with what you need to do. This is called a screencast video tutorial, and this is an example of pedagogy changing because of technology. In the old system, I would have asked you all to bring your laptops into the room, and I would have helped you do it in the room. Now I don't. I've made a video showing you how to do it. It's on the internet and you guys can do it for yourself. That means when you come into the classroom, we can actually use it and do it, which is the flipped classroom. Instead of me talking about it in the class and giving you the doing for homework when you're alone, you can install it at home and come into the classroom and we can do the doing in the classroom when I'm actually with you guys. And you can see all the instructions and so on. They're all on there. So... One of the things that I would suggest you do before you come to ICU, if you haven't already, is A, get a Gmail account, and B, get a Zotero account. I'll go to the webpage and install, follow these two instructions, and install Zotero on your Firefox and your Microsoft Word. This is the main Zotero page here. There's a big red download button and there's a register button up in the top right hand corner. You can create the account there. Um, almost all of you will really benefit from using it. Zotero really, really helps your referencing in your papers, as you can see with the two quick examples I gave. And Gmail has a whole pile of useful things that we didn't even have time to get to today. So make sure when you come to ICU, you've got a Gmail account and a Zotero account. That's the two biggest things that you can do technology-wise before you come. Now, we are finished a little bit early today, which is no real problem for you. It means you've got more time to go and have lunch. So I'm going to stop there. Um, anyone got any questions before we break for lunch? Questions? Nope. Okay, uh, we're about to go for lunch. By the end of this month, all of your essays should be graded by one of the ELA teachers. Then from the beginning of February until February 25th, you've got time to improve your essay based on the feedback that the teachers give you. And also in February, I'll give you the last presentation, the last lecture, which is on how to do presentations. So, and thanks for listening today. I'll see you guys later in February. Thanks.